Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Women's Health and Beyond. If you are a new listener, welcome to the show. All my other listeners, you guys are all intrigued today because really, honestly, it's not every day that a podcast like mine gets a guest like you're about to meet. The reality is she is the CEO and founder of Sprout, Sprout Pharmaceuticals, which owns a medication called AD, which we're going to get into later in the show. But this is a hypoactive sexual desire disorder. And this is what it treats. It treats low libido. And we're going to get into it and talk all about it because it's really going to blow your mind. But just equally as important as this is her journey. And, and, and she's going to walk us through from her childhood to her years in pharmaceuticals, to how she founded her first company, which is which is not even Sprout, it's Slate, uh, yeah. and how you sold that. But you guys, she has not only empowered women and done so in a way that's so elegant and appropriate that I'm really enamored with her, but she has sold companies where very few people can utter the word billion dollars. <laughs> that's what she did. But even better, she then got it back for a lot less than that, and now is, is spearheading it to an even bigger destination. So I welcome to the show, Cindy Ecker. Oh, thank you, doctor. I'm so excited to be here. I'm enamored with your work for women. Okay. It is my deep passion, and I love that you have that sort of advocacy for all of our better health. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, it's not hard. I'm a second generation OBGYN and a father of all daughters. Yep. <laughs> so, and as a gynecologist, I feel like I should be wearing pink. But. <laughs> Wait till wedding season begins for you. You're not yet in that season. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> you can see I'm, it coming. I started saving from that from the very start. <laughs> very smart. Very smart. Well, listen, let's get right into it because you have so much to say. And I know our time together is limited today. So, Cindy, what I really would love for you to share, because it's really hard to just run your own business, but imagine taking a business from scratch going against all odds because it's never easy and people forget the journey and the obstacles that they face. Yeah, yeah. But I would love to hear your story on, first of all, what, what made you you? Because it takes a special human being to have the backbone, the, the, the clarity, the vision um, to do what you've done and, and how you've sold two companies, one for, I believe, half a, half a billion dollars and the next for a billion dollars. Yeah. <laughs> and then not only that, you could have stopped there and been sipping champagne, but you have and you created something that I love, which is called the pink ceiling. And I want to see how you help entrepreneur females um, really harness their skills to take it to the next level and how you help them with capital funding and everything else you do and mentorships. So I'm going to leave it up to you. Just <laughs> Do your thing and talk. Well, to I'll, you know, I'll start with the, the basic for all yeah. of us, including you who run a very successful business um, in, in all of the ladies that are listening. You know, we think about success as this somebody who has all the answers, right? Somebody who had all the answers. And what I'm going to do is demystify that for you right now, because along the way, I tackled a lot of things I had no idea I'd never done before. And what was so clear to me is that thinking that I needed all of the answers to start was just holding me back. Success isn't about perfection or having all the answers. It's about having the courage, yes. take the first step. And yes. I feel like that was cultivated in me from a pretty young age, which I'm so fortunate for. I had a, a pretty unusual childhood. Uh, I moved every year from the fourth grade through my senior year of high school. So can you imagine every yeah. year I'm like the, the weird new kid showing yeah. up that doesn't have any friends, doesn't fit in any of the groups. And, you know, that, that was really catapulting me into this constant disruption and having to go into uncomfortable situations and figure it out. Totally. And figure out how to come through the other side. And I think you had a similarly disruptive yeah. childhood, right? Yeah. I mean, look, I moved, I, I lived in three countries like you. I think I went to three high schools, four yeah. junior highs. Yeah. And the reality was it was really tough as a kid. Yeah. And I don't think I appreciated the pearls I, I learned from it, but you're right. It, it gives you a, the ability to go into situations that are unfamiliar, uncomfortable, and, and just deal with them straight on because you have to do that. This is all we knew growing up. 
And we learned, we were survivors, I think. You are. Yeah. I think that's right, right? We're a little bit of the misfits. And there's a, there's a real gem to that yeah. is that you don't become defined by, you know, what, what any, anyone else sort of presupposes. You're not the jock. You're not the, you're not the cool kid. You're not the geek. You're not that you're just you. And it becomes a real force for independent thinking. And I think again, for everyone listening, we've all felt like misfits in the room at some point in our life. That's actually a real strength for you. Um, you should sort of harness that ability just to be comfortable, if you will, in that discomfort. I had this great, I'm going to go on a tangent, but I had a great opportunity with Microsoft where they picked disruptors in seven different fields. And I was so fortunate that they picked me in health. Wow. And the agreement was I had to sit with a performance psychologist who, who would, you know, put me down on the couch, ask me all sorts of questions to try to figure out like, okay, how are you wired this way? And I was his last interview of the seven. And so naturally I said, okay, what's the common thread? What did you figure I, out from all of these seven? I want to know. And his answer was all of you had a lot of change in your life. Right. And most of us had moved a lot in our life. And again, I think all that was, was again, flexing that muscle of being comfortable in discomfort, figuring it out. And all everyone listening has that ability. If you'll just push yourself in those situations. So my unusual childhood, um, you know, maybe pre preconditioned me to be an entrepreneur. I don't know that I knew it at the time because when I got out of college, um, I really took a very conventional path. My path was I was going to go work for the biggest, um, most admired company. Literally on my list was only one company and it was Fortune's most admired company, which at the time happened to be Merck Pharmaceuticals. Right. I always tease. It could have been an aerospace company. It could have been whatever, but at the time it was a pharmaceutical company. So here I show up, I, I've won the lottery that I get the job with Fortune's most admired company. And I realized really quickly, no way, no way am I just going to be a number. No way am I going to be employee 11,215. No way, because they're not listening to all my great ideas. <laughs> I was That's so true. sure, even at the start of my career, mm -hmm. I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to be heard. I wanted to uh, make an impact. And that's what really started my journey, chasing smaller companies, innovation, learning from people, doing things that were against the grain. And I guess that ultimately built my confidence to start my own business, which was called Slate Pharmaceuticals. And, uh, and I named it Slate Truly, Clean Slate. I was going to do it on my own terms. I was going to make my own messes. I would have to clean them up. Um, and that was my first uh, roller coaster ride of entrepreneurship. First of all, I love the name because it's, 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 it speaks very clearly to who you are, which is a disruptor and really doing things on your own terms, yeah. which I love. Um, and I think you brought up such good points. I mean, you're right. I, I think we all entrepreneurs have a certain quality and I see it in myself sometimes, which is it's not that we're so passionate about what we do Yeah. that for me, at least my practice has, I, I really push the envelope because not because I'm trying to be different because I, I constantly look at things and, and imagine how I can make them different in my yes. own. Yes. And, when you, and when you have the ability and, and being safe and, and I mean, I, I think, the difference is you can push the envelope as long as patient safety is there, obviously, but you, you, you should challenge the grain and, and, yes. and make things different. For example, and I, I don't want to deter, but the audience knows I invented a procedure for Barthlin cyst. Yeah. And honestly, it was not in my wildest imagination to ever be known as the Barthlin cyst doctor. Yeah. And it's been the biggest blessing of my life because one day I realized I could do it different. And I was scared and I was nervous and I was afraid to be outcasted, but I went for it and I've never looked back and that's how I lead my life. And I think yeah. that's how you lead your life. And I think for everybody who's out there, if you have those visions, don't be scared because I think fear is what holds most of us back. Yeah. And you know that we don't have the answers. I don't have the answers. We all think you have the answers, but in reality, you're just rolling with the punches. You're using your wit, your smarts, your, your know-how to figure it out. Yeah. And I think, you know, we, this is a, a, a sigh of relief for everyone. Kind of the popularity, popularity contest ended in your youth. 
And the only person who gets to vote you most likely to succeed as an adult is you. You. And and that is entirely in your control and in your power. And I love, this is what I admire in your work and in your innovation. It is that you are wired with curiosity. And the most successful people I know cultivate their curiosity constantly, Mm -hmm. right? Again, it's not different for different sake. It's because they're always thinking like, Hmm, could that be a little bit better? Could I try that a different way? How did that person do it? I love telling this story. When when I first had Slate, so Slate had at the time, it was the only FDA approved long acting testosterone for men. And it was a pellet. So put in under the surface of the skin and uh, it was this little in-office procedure, but it was new to the urology community. So when we started doing it, we started filming the techniques of all of these different surgeons around the world doing this in-office procedure. We showed up at our first medical conference and we showed an assortment of the videos. And I watched the audience and I had the most incredible observation. Like, you know, these are a bunch of surgeons. You'll you'll go with me for a second. Bunch of urologists. They're sitting there and their arms are crossed. 99% of the audience was like, oh, that's not how you do it. No. 1% of the audience was like, whoa, what did they just do there? I never thought of doing it that way. You and I both know which ones were the top surgeons in the world. For sure. The one percenters were leaning in, learning more. And I think that's a lesson for all of us in our everyday life. How boring would it be if we were to wake up tomorrow and think we knew it all? And if you cultivate that curiosity, the possibilities for you are endless in terms of what you can be a part of, the creation, and really, I think your personal sort of contentment. Yeah, for sure. And I think for everybody out there, it was a hard lesson for me to learn. But I think once you realize, like you said, you're your only hero when you grow up. Yeah. And if you've done something well, if you've done something different, then you're going to get the haters and they're going to come after you. But when you get those haters and those criticizers, then you've made it because that's when you know you're onto something big. And so I'm not, I don't want to say you need a thick skin because all of us are sensitive. I'm super sensitive. I can't tell you I'm a cry baby. Like if something, somebody hurts my, but I won't show it at that moment, but I'm very sensitive. But the difference is I realize that when you do things differently, it's, it's difficult in the beginning. People don't want to accept it. Yeah. And I know, and, and this is going to bring us right in. So you sold Slate and we'll, we'll leave it at that because we don't have the time. Yeah. You started Sprout Pharmaceuticals. So how did a D come and how, I know you've had this tremendous obstacle written course yeah. with the FDA to finally get it to where you needed it to be. It was a uphill battle yeah. that most, I would say most CEOs of pharmaceutical companies would have closed that chapter and moved on to something else. Yeah. Um, yeah but you sure. didn't, you, you pursued it. So tell us how, why, and, and, and what drove A bit you? against all odds, I would say. Yeah. Well, look, I had lightning strike and my lightning struck when I watched the videos of women who were living with um, this condition, HSDD, you mentioned it, low sexual desire. And it's frustrating to them and it's been persistent and it's really causing them to have you know, a lot of personal sort of, you know, your own moxie, like self-confidence issues, as well as relationship issues. And I watched videos of women with this at the same time that this extraordinary science was being presented that showed there was a biological basis for this, that it was basically a brain chemistry issue for women. And I'm watching all of the big companies with all the resources in the world walk away. And that was my signal to to walk in. I I looked at this company, I'm running this really successful company. I've gotten beyond like the dark days of startup when it's so hard. And now our sales are flying. We're doing so well at Slate. And I was like, you know what? I'm running this company for men. There are 26 FDA approved drugs for some form of male sexual dysfunction and not a single one for women. You're right. Are you kidding me? When we know from the prevalence data that more women than men actually suffer from sexual dysfunction. And so it was this perfect storm, right? I'm assessing like, okay, it's great that I run Slate, but I offer one of 26 solutions. There's a solution to be had right here because the science is emergent 
and no one's moving toward it. I'm selling off my profitable company and men and taking this on. And my board thought I had lost my mind. (laughs) I want you to know, they said, wait, what? Pfizer hasn't done this, Cindy. Um, We have this great company now. We're making money. And I said, I'm selling it. We're going back to zero and we're taking this on. And I really felt it. David is like a calling. Something spoke to me so deeply in the videos at women. And I knew I wanted this solution in the world. I wanted to be able to have this option. Um, But little did I know what a challenge it would be. So I sold off Slate. I I literally sprouted out of Slate um, with Addy and uh, sold it off, took this on. And it was a journey. It was a journey. And I thought it would just be, you know, our world double blinded placebo controlled trials. It's just very straightforward science. There's instruments that we use to measure uh, this condition. And yet what it did is it ignited, I think a conversation about really how we feel culturally about women's pleasure. And so we weren't really science had given us the answer, but a lot of our personal opinion was clouding if you will, um, what was so obvious and right in front of us when it came to Addie's data. So that was a a fascinating path. Um, My parents tease me. They always say, could you not have created something for diabetes? (laughs) And I I know what they're saying is, you know what, if you're not diabetic, you probably don't have a point of view on a medication for diabetes, but by God, every single one of us actually has an opinion on something for sex. Yeah, and it's it's really sad to see the the big difference on our approach as physicians in healthcare yeah. on how we treat men versus women. Um, I know in my practice, which focuses a lot on sexual medicine, um, there's very few tools in our arsenal yeah. to really improve sensation, to improve yeah. desire, um, and all this stuff. Absolutely, so pain, lubrication, pain, arousal, yes. all of these issues that women are struggling with and millions of women are struggling with. It's a bit of the dirty little secret, isn't it? That what we don't see, I think, or at least if you're not in this world or you're, you know, you're not, this isn't your industry. What you don't realize is for the problem in women's health research is that companies know there's an extraordinary market. What they're concerned about is the path will be longer and the hurdles will be higher. And Addie's a perfect example of that. Viagra came to market with fast track approval, meaning the FDA thought it met such an important unmet medical need for men. It was raced through in six months. It took Addie six years and we had three times as many patients worth of data in our clinical trials. You tell me we don't have a different standard for male versus female. And it's unfortunate. It's changing. This is important. Like the optimist to me, this is changing. And, um, and we're going to see an entire renaissance, I think in women's health, but for a long time, that's been the double standard. Yeah. I mean, you as at the helm is going to be amazing, but you're right. It's so sad. I mean, in in the 1970s or early eighties, they came out with Viagra, correct? Yes. And then Mm -hmm. right afterwards, it was the big push. It was all over the place. And like you said, dozens of medications follow suit. Uh, And and if you actually think about when hypoactive sexual desire disorder was diagnosed. Yeah. It was a while back. This is not like. 70s. Yes. 70s. (laughs) And why did it take all the way till till almost 2015, 16 for us to to see something come to fruition on the market that would help women? who suffer from this and who's ruined relationships, who's had all these issues. um, And we always blame it on psychology, on hormone imbalance. That's right. And and, and I can't tell you that, I mean, I get asked every day in my practice and we talk about low libido, low desire, low lubrication. And the things I hear, the stories from other physicians who have opinionated their their opinions or i don't even know if that's proper english i by the way i grew up in france so forgive me I love it. Uh, but i hear oh just have a glass of red wine and just take it and enjoy it i mean for real come on it's Anyways, terrible I'm so no, glad. So, it's so, you so this- true though that's you hit on such an important point because i think fundamentally if something goes wrong for men we say biology we we accept it and we and we address it if something goes wrong for women we go 
psychology. You're just freaking out. And this shows up in a lot of data in medicine, like even the oh, wait yeah. times in ERs. And it, it, it doesn't come from a terrible place in a way, right? We, we tell women all the time, just relax. You're just stressed. And it's not a, we don't mean it in a malicious way. But if we check ourselves, we then realize how dismissive it is of just her basic biology. Of course, women bring biology into the bedroom. Men and women alike do. And that's why Addie was such an important discovery, I think, to open the doors and really crash the ceiling, if you will, for a lot of these other innovations in women's health to come. So, Cindy, you, you start your studies with Addie. You meet with the yes. FDA, I'm assuming, yes. first to set up yes. your parameters for your study. Correct. Um, they, do they seem pretty enthusiastic and optimistic? Are they into this idea? Or mm. are you feeling <laughs> that maybe there's a little bit of a first mm. hurdle right there? You know, it was eye-opening for me, having run a company in the male space, to sure. see this, like, dramatic difference in terms of attitudes, enthusiasm. And I think that, um, again, like the people at the FDA, we have wonderful scientists at the FDA, but they're human. And they bring to the table the same sort of human lens of whatever their own experience is, whatever their cultural feelings are towards sex, what they were brought up with psychologically, so where they are in their relationship. Yep. And it's deep when it comes to women. And, you know, the first, the first sign, David, was we were being reviewed by the urology division. And right. this is the drug that works on brain chemistry. And, you know, I dared to ask the question, why are we being reviewed by this division? And the answer was, we review all the sex drugs. Well, guess what? All the sex drugs were for men. Right. This was the first ever. So yes, for sure. The path was really um, disheartening for me, eye-opening for me in terms of what could be really unconscious bias that was present. The good twist of it was when I was challenged uh, by the FDA, I challenged them back. And the challenge was simple. Talk to the women who are suffering with it. Shouldn't we always, and it's actually a mandate even of our FDA, that in new drug discovery, you put the patients at the center of the conversation because who else should we be talking to sure. other than the patients struggling with it? And that was the moment of shift when we actually just listened to women, heard the stories of their struggles with this. All of a sudden we were looking at the data. I don't think we were even looking at the data at the outset. No, you're right. And, and just to clarify for the audience. So you said Viagra gets through the FDA in six months. Six months. Track. Yes. You guys enroll over 13,000 patients in your studies, as opposed right. to what, 3,000 patients for Viagra? Correct. I That's remember right. reading. Yeah. Um, you do all this amazing work. You, you follow every single one of their guidelines, their endpoints mm -hmm. that they want you to claim on, and it doesn't get approved. <laughs> I mean, I can't even imagine how that feels uh -oh. because I think I would be wanting to crawl into a hole and disappear wow. That's after spending all this money, energy, time to get that kind. So, but you didn't, you, 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 you rose it, up even stronger. It was a brutal day. I learned that news on a Friday and I have told this story, but it was, I had just landed. I'd flown back um, to, I'm based in Raleigh, North Carolina, flown back to Raleigh and my team, this was the date. So companies know the date that yep. they're going to hear from the FDA. So like my team has the champagne chilling. They're like ready. A like, we're getting, of course, yeah, the rosé really. <laughs> um, they're like, we're getting approved. Um, right. And of course we thought that because we'd done all the studies with these parameters that were agreed upon with the FDA. We'd met these endpoints with statistical significance, right? We passed the, the hurdle, if you will, for proving um, efficacy. And then I get this call from my assistant that they've turned us down. And I was like, don't tell anybody. I sat in the airport to your point and cried, cried, like just was totally yeah. shell-shocked. And what I felt was I'm letting everyone down. I'm letting all my team down. I'm letting all the people who bet on me down. I'm letting women down. And I went into the office, I told everybody, I gathered everybody around the table and like they came to the table with smiles. And I was like, 
We just got turned down by the FDA. Go home and work on your resumes. The and hardest they, speech you've ever made, right? The worst. I waited. Like I looked out my window in my office till the last car left, left the parking lot. And then I walked out and I took to the bed. I cry. I mean, I cry thinking about like all the emotion of that. And my phone is blowing up. You know, my, my board is calling, my investors are calling. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I had no plan. What could I possibly say? The FDA held our fate in their hand. And so I very fortunately, the next morning I woke up, I don't know what to do, but work. So I get on my laptop and I had a note from a woman who'd been in our clinical trials. And that was like divine intervention. You yeah, know, that yeah. like a total stranger reached out to me. She'd seen like a blip that said we'd been rejected. She had been on Addy and she said, will you meet me? She lived about three hours away. I got in my car and I started driving. Yes, I'll meet you. Wow. I, I went to a coffee shop. We'd never seen each other before. This woman walks in the coffee shop. I knew it was her in a minute, you know, type A in charge, like coming across the room. And she told me her story. She said like, this, this is what she said. She'd raised two beautiful boys. She loved her husband, loved her husband. She ran her own company. She said, Cindy, I have succeeded at everything in my life other than this. She'd been struggling with HSCD for years and her marriage was really suffering from it. She'd gone into the Addy clinical trial. She'd seen a glimmer of hope. It happened to work for her. It doesn't work for everybody. Um, and she just reminded me in that moment why I was doing this in the first place for her, for the validation that what she felt was real. She was not alone. Millions of women had this same, the same issue. And if we have a solution for them, then they deserve the option with their doctor for whether or not they, they get it. And I basically, it woke me up again. I went back home. I gathered the whole team around the table again on Monday. I think they were waiting for, you know, their last paycheck. And I said, we're going to dispute the FDA. Unbelievable. But and, you know, Cindy, I think you give such a, an incredible lesson right there. And it's something that we all need to remember. Look, starting a business on your own, and this is for everybody, and, it, and we're not talking building a billion-dollar company. Whatever your dream is, yeah. you're going to run into obstacles. Life is not easy. It's not easy for me. It's not easy for Cindy, who's built an enormous company. It's not easy for anyone. But if you have that passion inside, yeah, and you have that clarity because you know you're right, you know that the end goal, you see it. You mm -hmm. feel it. You see it as palpable. And I really believe when something becomes that palpable, you cannot take it away. Yeah. And, and so you yeah. did what you did best, which is get back on your feet, ride yeah. that horse all the way to the end. And yeah. everybody, and success is defined by that. I think it anybody is. who can say that they, they were able to skate through their journey of building a company to the very end without any obstacles is lying. Absolutely. And, there's yeah. moments you can't pay people. There's moments you can't, yes. there's so many moments where you will feel, you'll question yourself, you'll question your capability. And it is about the, the definition is I think life throws you these challenges to see how much do you really want it? Like how much you really believe in it. And for me, that woman, it was a gift that yeah. she reached out to me because she came brought but, right back home exactly why I was doing it. She brought you to your core, which she is did. really what you needed at that time. That's right. Everybody yeah. has to have that purpose, right? What is, why are you doing this? And I think if you're just doing it for money, it, it's exactly. never the same. If you're do, if there's something bigger than you for why you're doing this, for an impact that you want to see in this world, that kind of fuel is, um, it'll get you back up on those really hard days. Absolutely. And that's why that fire that you have, that passion is what it, it goes through osmosis. Your entire team feels it. They, they are on it. They, they yeah. absorb it. They, but let's fast forward because you are successful. You beat the FDA, <laughs> they approve the medication. Yeah. Things are going amazing. You get approval and all of a sudden you have a buyer for your company. I know. Am I going to get into it? You sell it. Yes. You're done. You're, you, but you're not done because no. <laughs> you right away jump into another project, which is unbelievable. Who goes from selling Slate to starting a brand new company to selling it for an even bigger amount and then starting all over again. So you start the pink ceiling, the pink incubator. Yeah. And then we'll get back into, believe it or not, guys, she gets the company back. That's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. I, you know what? It's, um, it's what I love to do. I mean, when I sold uh, Sprout for a billion dollars, people were like, oh, 
what'd you do the next day? And I said, I got up and I went to work awesome. and I think it disappoints a lot of people, but that's what I do. That's what I love to do. Like, let's take it to the mat and let's start over again. That's your happy place. It is like, let's go again. Let's go back to zero. Let's start over again. Let's do. And I, I think it's just because the definition of success for me is impact. And my work isn't done. I'm still capable. I can still show up. I can go to work. What am I doing to like create change? And, and I think now help other people get to the kind of outcomes I got there, other women in particular. So well, let's when get I, into that because yeah. I think that's just, I think the audience is going to be blown away with this next, next little segment, you guys. Cindy go ahead, goes and creates this platform that allows women or companies that cater to women come on board. And if, and they decide if this is a company they're going to represent. And yeah, correct. If I'm correct. Wrong. Yes. And if, if you are picked, handpicked, then you have access to Cindy as a mentor, her team, her marketing, her expertise, and her capital funds yeah. to bring you from a startup all the way to the finish line. Yeah. So this is called the pink ceiling. It is. Yeah. Is we, actually, were... we, we call our space the pink incubator. Because we, we needed an incubator that wasn't like, you know, craft beer and bros and hoodies. So we've got like, it's beautiful and pink and rosé on tap, just like we were well, talking about. Just for that, I want you to know, I went out and bought myself so I could be part of the pink club. My own I pink love club. it. So for the rest of the show, <laughs> I'm in pink also. Amazing. I love it. Oh my gosh. I tell, love tell it. Us about, tell, tell us about some of the companies that are coming through and yeah. what you guys do. And if there's somebody in the audience, if you guys have an amazing idea that you know is, is the next big thing, yeah. reach out. Yeah. I love your audience is passionate about women's health. And that's what I'm passionate with. Those are the kind of companies we're looking for health and wellness that is real disruption. We love the crazy firsts, right? People who are disruptors like me want to see this in the world um, and things that often will change the conversation. So we have products like the world's first flushable pregnancy test. I know. I love How cool that. is that? Okay. Only a woman, I think, would have invented, David, you might have invented this, but I, I only a certain very small subset of guys would do this. And it's so cool when you think about you know, 80% of a pregnancy test today is plastic, but it doesn't plastic, have to be. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if you could have the equal effectiveness in something that is completely, you know, able, biodegradable, why wouldn't I pick that? Plus yeah. you have discretion. If you want discretion, a lot of women today test at work. They'd prefer to not leave the evidence in the waste paper basket. Sure. They'd like to flush it away. Yeah. So it just gives optionality. Um, you know, we had technology that detects date rape drugs and drinks with a single droplet of um, liquid out of the drink. And we have modern fertility, which created- well, Hold on a second, because that's that's unbelievable. So you mean to tell me if I'm a, if I'm at a bar yeah. and, and, I'm, and somebody buys me a drink- yeah. And unfortunately, on college campuses, this actually happens. It and, does. And you can test for a substance within the drink yeah. almost immediately. How does it work? Immediately. Yeah, you can put it on the back of your phone as a little disc or on a keychain, dip my finger in my drink, touch it with a droplet of water. It runs the test for me. It shows me if there's in, in, about, in about 30 seconds whether or not there's a date rape drug in that drink. Please tell me every campus is going to give that out. Oh, I, we we work closely with colleges today. Fraternities giving it out. It's yeah. just these are the these are the inventions that you know my, me and my team want to see in this world, and we love giving access. You know, to women deserve mentors. It's crazy that there isn't as much mentorship as there should be. There deserve to be a lot more women in the billion dollar club. That's really what we're trying to fix through, through access to capital, access to mentorship, and really finding these incredible ideas and just moving them along. Cause I know how hard it can be. I mean, if you look at the venture capital landscape today, 2% of all venture capital goes to female founded businesses. Wow. Just 2%. That's unbelievable. I did not know that. So half the population has 2% of the good ideas. That's ridiculous. And yeah. so we're hoping to be, you know, some, some small part of that change. Well, you are. What an unbelievable company you are. And I think that, that lends to why the culture of your company is so special. Oh, thank uh, you. I mean, I, for, for those who, who don't, I mean, who are not part of healthcare providers, reps come and visit us all the time. When, when your rep comes and visits us, there's a certain energy that they bring. Oh. Uh, and I think they, they do because 
they just really 150% believe in what they're, they're promoting. You have one of my best. I, I, I affectionately call her I mean, Maddie. She came by yesterday, Maddie, Maddie. <laughs> and I, I, I just wanted to give her a hug. I really did. And I know she's going to be listening, so you owe me a hug next time. It is good. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So all right. So so you sell you sell you sell the initial company. You get it back. How did you? How did that happen? Yeah, that was that was interesting. Can you imagine entrepreneurs' dream come true? I mean, totally. I'm, sold this business, They're, this huge company is going to take it across the world. They're going to make it affordable for women, accessible. And then uh, they put it on the shelf. They put it on the shelf. Do you know Talk, why? Their company had- um, I know they had some internal issues. They had their own internal issues. They changed their CEO. Uh, their stock price fell dramatically. They were the darling. When they bought us, they were the darling. And um, they hadn't reported this relationship they had with the pharmacy. All of a sudden, stock starts falling. Their house is on fire. They basically save the products that they already had, right? The big brands. And this is the last thing in that isn't really launched. So they'd have put no energy toward it. And I was crushed, crushed. We'd fought so hard, 26 drugs for men. Finally, there's one for women. And now women can't get it. It's not in any pharmacy. They can't get it. I was devastated. And that, again, you have those moments, right? I can either sit there and feel sorry for myself. I can kick myself in the ass and go do something about it. And I decided, you know, these really important kind of words that my dad would always say to me, not on my watch, right? right? Are you going to do not on my watch? Is this going to happen? And I went back to the company and I said, give it back. <laughs> I can't believe that. We just gave you a, a billion dollars cash for it. Um, it's worth a lot. It is worth, it's a huge market potential. And I said, yeah, but women can't get it. And you agreed to do these things. So when I wrote that contract, I made sure that there were really specific performance obligations and they weren't making a huge ask, but it was about education to OBGYNs across the country. It was about salespeople, et cetera. And they had agreed and they weren't doing it. So it gave me leverage. So basically, since they weren't meeting their contractual obligations, I had a window in and I ended up getting it back. I mean, that's unbelievable. We kept the billion dollars and that's what we used to invest in women through our pink ceiling. <laughs> so now that you got it back, yeah. are you, have you, I mean, look, through maturity and seeing the company grow, yeah. when you decided to take on Sprout again and, and Addy, did you decide to change the angle a little bit of the, is there anything you decided to do differently to take it to the next level again? You know, I think... I, um, yes, a couple things. One, sadly, you have a, a really special relationship with your patients, but I think there's a lot of women who don't feel comfortable even bringing this up to their provider. So we made sure that through telehealth, they could basically have this conversation from the privacy of their home and it could deliver to their doorstep. I wanted to remove any shame or stigma. It shouldn't be there, but it is. It still is today for women to admit like, hey, this is me. Is there something I can do about it? And so that's a big piece of it. Certainly they can go to their provider. We hope that they will be with a provider where they can have this conversation, but that's a, a piece of it. And I think now it's just about letting women know. I'll just share another thing that will just for everybody to consider for a second. For the last 20 years, you have not watched a Super Bowl in which you haven't been shown something that says, oh, like a satisfying sex life is, is great, right? The subtext was, if you're a man, we're not even conscious that all of those ads for Viagra, for Cialis, for Levitra that talked about you know, sexual dysfunction that normalized that conversation only normalized it for men. Yeah. And I think we're not even conscious that women have been missing from that conversation for so long. That's the difference today. Think about what a watershed moment it was when Viagra was approved. Addie should really have received the same fanfare, but we're so shy about talking about women's sexuality or so conflicted about it that if I go to a cocktail party today and people say, what do you do? And I say, well, I created the little pink pill for women. They go, what? there's a little pink pill for women. They've never heard of it. I know. And we should all wonder why that is. So that's really my biggest change, David, is noise. 
is making sure that women even know that these options exist for them and they should feel comfortable talking to their healthcare provider. And they can do a really simple screener to understand if this might be what they're struggling with. It's it's not for everyone, low libido is not HSDD, right? To be clear. But well, there are there are tools to understand whether or not treatment might be appropriate for you. And we're going to get into talking about it right now in, in more depth because I want the audience to really get a good understanding of what a D is and what it does and how yeah. it works. But before we go there, I'm just going to leave you with one last comment on what you just said. Look, Cindy runs a billion dollar company. She has she's her schedule is I'm sure beyond packed. And just to show you the difference, she took an hour out of her busy day to speak with a one little provider in Santa Monica, California, because she is making the noise that you're talking about, oh, because you're trying to reach as many people and explain it to them. And, and I knew that. And, 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 and when I was thinking, why would she have taken a, a, a conversation with me on my podcast? And the only conclusion, I, and this is something I actually thought about this morning, I said, she is a disruptor. She is going on every channel, on every microphone, yeah. so she can shout from every mountain, which she truly believes in. Whether they're small or big, she's giving it 100%, and so I really appreciate that, oh. and it speaks wonders about who you are, your character, and your company. That's so, so nice. Thank you. It's my it's my privilege to get to talk to you. It's my privilege no, to I'm talk. Being honest. This is a, this is really, this shows, you know, it's, it's about action, People talk, but you you are showing action, which is so commendable. Thank you. Well, let's get into it. So Adid comes to market. You mentioned it's the first FDA approved yes. medication for females to combat what's been around since the 1970s called <laughs> yes. hypoactive sexual desire disorder. You mentioned it doesn't fix everything. But it does it sure, not. But it sure helps a lot. It, so let's it get into it. So the FDA wants you to do the study and they want you to meet three criteria, I believe, yes. right? three important endpoints. And your 16,000 patients show that these endpoints have positive results. What are they? Okay. So we had to show that we increased your desire for sex and you use an instrument called the female sexual function index. It's been around forever. So it's a questionnaire and, um, and we show with statistical significance that we increase women's desire for sex. We also had to say, do they have more satisfying sexual events? So they're more interested. Are they having more satisfying sex? Yes, was the answer in clinical trials. They had more satisfying sexual events. And importantly, were they less distressed from having this condition? Yes, that's important because if you're not having sex and you do not care, never take a medication for it. I mean, we get into this sort of philosophical conversation about this and people miss that it's really a, a group of women who have something going on neurochemically. We require this magical balance, right, of dopamine and serotonin to respond to sexual cues. And for a large number of women, that balance goes off at some point in their life. We can speculate as to why. Is it long-term use of birth control? Is it postpartum when their hormones normalize, but this is off kilter? Whatever that reason is, we know that happens for a ton of women. And that's really where we believe Addy is working. It's working on that balance, if you will, of excitement and inhibition and that right tension that you have to have to respond to sexual cues. Aside from that, let's get into, because look, every medication has good. Yeah. And unfortunately has sometimes some side effects. So for let's sure. just put it out there because I don't want anybody to think that this is a hundred percent effective for everybody and a hundred percent safe. There's, there's some guidelines you have to follow. So tell us a little bit, because I think when it, it first came out, um, there was some issues with alcohol intake yep. and the medication. Um, and some of these now have changed as per the FDA yeah. recommendations. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about these recommendations as per the FDA and what's been approved? Yeah. Now? So Addy, you're so right. All drugs, everything, including Benadryl, we take Leave Viagra, right? Have risks and benefits, and that's really the decision you're making with your doctor, right? Are, do the are the benefits? Do I want to expose sure. myself to these risks for these potential benefits? And the risks of Addy most commonly are sleepiness, dizziness, nausea. So those are our top three side effects. We actually dose Addy daily at bedtime for that reason because it will make you sleepy. We so study it's an everyday it in, pill. 
it's an everyday night. I call it, you know, the nightstand medication, like literally take it right when you go to bed. So it's um, not like Viagra, for example, where I'm going to pop in a few hours before having a good time. That's, that's right. It isn't because it's really, I, it's funny that the media called it female Viagra. Um, contextually, that was right. It was like a big, you know, the first ever uh, for women, but it's more like female Cialis because, you know, Cialis many men take daily and it's so that like it's on board um, all the time. It's not like taking something going, hey, meet me back in the bedroom in three hours. Um, so, you know, that's a women tend to like that, that it allows spontaneity for sexual events like the kids are in bed. OK, we're good tonight. Um, but from a from a it works. Oh, on don't fool yourself. There's lunches to be made. There's homework <laughs> right. to be finished. That's right. Laundry full. There's Fair there's enough. Laundry, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, the Addy works on brain chemistry, like we've talked a, a little bit about. And um, and so anything else that would have an impact on brain chemistry, drinking, right? Other substances that have a, a what we call CNS kind of impact, you have to have careful consideration. So I think what was started out is people thinking you could never drink on Addy. Well, scientifically, that wasn't correct. And the FDA looked at a lot of our scientific data where we measured, you know, a, a real world circumstance. A woman had a couple glasses of wine with dinner. She went to bed several hours later. She took Addy at bedtime. What happens? And so basically our recommendation is if you have three or more drinks, don't take Addy that night. Skip the dose, take it the next night. If you're out, you know, like with friends at a cocktail party and you're into your fifth glass, don't take Addy that night. I mean, Cindy, if I was into my fifth class, I'd be falling asleep. Before I I got to bed. All right. Yeah. So three or more, skip your dose. Right. Two, two, like up to two drinks, wait two hours. So again, that scenario where like you've stopped drinking before you're taking your Addy, you have a little bit of time distance from it. Um, that's really their, their recommendation. And you can find all of this on our website in our, in our safety information in our black box warning about what happens if you don't follow those directions. So all of that is, is on our website. And, and before, I mean, at the end, we're going to talk about where people, you guys can find more information. The website is amazing. It's really loaded with so much good information um, and, and something, but if I were to start it today, when can I anticipate? Yeah seeing a difference and, and what qualifies a difference? Like, yeah. am I going to be horny all the time and <laughs> jump my husband? Or yeah. is, this, is this just, you're going to feel more like you, because before I want to backtrack. This medication is meant for somebody who at one point in their life had a normal desire. That's right. right? That's and, right. And, and did not, and, and this wasn't part of the issue that's only become an issue. So, so I think the goal, just like when we do anything in science is to bring you back to how you felt before. Exactly. Right? The, so the, the you're not gonna be hypersexual. No, it would be the, right? We would have looked at that in studies as a negative effect if we were creating you know, hypersexuality or nymphomania as people would right, call right. it. Um, we're really about restoring back to a level you once knew, back to your normal, your happy place, if you will. It's not the, the best parallel I can think of that, you know, many of us and your listeners have experience with is depression medications, right? If you treat somebody who's depressed, you're not thinking you're making them euphoric, right? They're not euphoric every right. day. They're coming back to a normal they once knew that was a, a, a better place for them. It brain chemistry, right? It's working on, so it's so much of the parallel, just like you take an antidepressant daily, you take Addy daily for that sexual function. Um, so uh, it's a, it's been a fascinating, obviously, uh, product to, uh, to be, because there are all of those misconceptions like, oh my God, am I going to go out and take like the hot waiter home? That's a no, that's not, I mean, that's you not, can, but yeah, <laughs> you can't, oh, of course, don't have more than two drinks, more yeah. power to you, but it's really about like that res restoration and, um, and I think you, you feel it over time, just like, just like if you started an antidepressant, they would recommend you stay on it for three months to feel really that climb of, you know, effect, if you will, to, to realize its maximum impact. Similar with Addy, um, we recommend you stay on it for eight weeks. And if you, if you don't have any effect by then, go off of it, probably not going to ever work for you, but you, you'll, it's subtle changes, right? Sure. It's about often one of the first things we hear from women is fantasy, 
they'll have a sexual thought. Yeah. Which is so you know, important. Yeah. They'll be like, I don't, I can't remember the last time I, I, I had dream. a thought yeah. like that. Yeah. Right. Or a sex dream, or it's the little cues that your brain is that biological drive that all humans are wired with has reignited. And then I think it's about, you know, receptivity to your partner um, in a way that you haven't been before. Maybe initiation, if you're an initiator, um, suddenly you're gonna be like, okay, honey, like let's get the check and get out of here um, on date night. And, and we hear obviously all different stories because everyone's, everyone's norm is different for sex, right? And that was one of the things when we were going forward with this that I would always be asked like, well, I mean, how much sex? is really like, how much more sex do women need? How much is enough? And I thought, you don't choose. She gets to, first of all, like it's her call. Somebody may think that their norm is, you know, seven days a week. Other people may be happy once a month. Sure. Um, and I think it's completely up to them. And that's what we were looking at in clinical trials is taking them from where they were to a different place. Yeah. Place where they'd be happy. And, and on top of it, for any of you listeners out there, I know it's happening because I see it and I see women coming into my practice. They've asked their doctors that exact question. I, I, and I get asked all the time, I, I don't understand my libido's down. My husband gets really upset with me. I don't know what to do. I just don't feel aroused anymore. Yeah. So as long as it's not, there's, there's no medical condition, there's no drug interaction. Yeah. Um, a lot of times physicians will say, like we said in the very beginning of your show, Oh, let me give you an SSRI. How about we put you on Prozac? Yeah. To that condition. Yeah. Well, guess what happens on Prozac? Yeah. It's Kills quite the opposite, right? right? Exactly. So if exactly. that's out there and that's you, then you know where to turn to now and, and check out this website and talk to your provider. So if I'm interested in this medication, is this going to cost me a fortune? Uh, $20 a month. If your insurance pays, we have done an exceptional job of getting insurers to pay for the medication. So it's $20 a month. It, and if your insurer doesn't pay, it's only $99 a month until they do. And we'll go to work on them. So that's our commitment as a company, because the men have had their Viagra, Cialis, et cetera, paid for for decades. Um, so we believe women deserve the same. Yep. And, and so far, honestly, we're doing really well with that. So we, we are often um, getting insurers to cover it. And again, $99, we have a bundle where if they're a cash patient, they can basically get three months for the price of two. Got it. So okay, we're going to so go guys, this. We're there, they are erasing the barriers to being able to get this medication at an affordable price for everybody out there. That's really important. Um, what about, you know, you had Slate, which was a testosterone based companies. A yeah. lot of, a lot of practices today, it's become very in and hot and popular to treat women with, with hyposexual desire with testosterone. Mm. Sometimes it works, but it's mm -hmm. maybe not the solution to everything. Yeah. So now that you're on the other side and, and you're now with a, a more neurochemical balanced yeah. medication, do you, can, when somebody says they're on testosterone, do you turn to them and say, well, that's great, but you should maybe in addition take a D or do you recommend they stop testosterone? How does that work? You know, I look, I think it's a decision with their, with their physician. Testosterone, as you know, is not approved for this condition. Um, there've been some, some companies that have tried to get approval through the FDA. They haven't been successful, um, in terms of their, uh, side of, you know, efficacy versus uh, risk profile. And um, so I always believe in the FDA approved options for conditions to try those first. But for sure, the testosterone consideration in a postmenopausal woman is real. And I, I, I have friends that have taken it with success, friends who have taken it and in, in without success. Um, so I think it's really a decision uh, with the doctor. But I'm a I'm I'm a bit of a scientific snob in the sense of, and I, I this is for everything in my life that I take products for. I believe that you should explore the ones that have been proven safe and effective for that particular so use that case yeah. first um, and before you, you start to experiment with some of the others. Now, why is testosterone so rampant? Because think about it. We had those solutions for men for all these years and we didn't have solutions for women. So we started playing with those, if you will, for women because there was such an incredible need. So I totally understand um, that, that use in the U.S. Yeah. across the world. Yeah. 
And, and I think there's a sexual revolution, and I don't mean purely, it's not Woodstock I'm talking about. Right. I'm yeah. talking about the acceptance that it's okay to admit that your personal relationship doesn't yeah. have the best sex life because there's circumstances. So therapy, you guys, is super important. Exactly. Finding common grounds with your partner is super important. And reaching out to your healthcare provider and discussing and not being afraid to discuss a, a D testosterone, hormone balance, whatever it is, PRP therapy. Um, there's so many amazing tools that are coming out almost on a daily basis to help women feel better about themselves. And if your provider is not giving you those answers, I hate to say it, find somebody new because there's plenty of people who are progressive and thinking outside the box who want to help you. I believe um, that wholeheartedly. So if find I'm somebody new. They're not helping you. Yeah. Is it women? Not, we are in a revolution and it's because yes. women are taking charge of this because we understand we deserve options too. And I really do believe we're at like this whole next frontier to your point. Maybe it's not Woodstock and, uh, and free love. And, but, but we've been in the reproduction conversation for so long. And I think we're finally in the pleasure and satisfaction conversation Absolutely. and when we get to take ownership of it. I love that. And, and we're going to, we're all going to push forward that concept because it's the only way to be. So let me ask you, if I want to find out more information about yes. the pink ceiling, sprout pharmaceuticals and a D, where, where, where should I go to, to check, get more information, learn more about you, your company, what you guys offer? Well, I hope you'll follow me at Cindy Pink CEO. I'm always in pink, little pink pill. Look at this pink hat. I love it. Um, Addy is spelled A-D-D-Y-I. So Addy.com. Again, you can find all the safety information um, as well there. And then the pink ceiling is the pink ceiling.com. And if you have a great idea, I hope you'll pitch us. And then don't forget you guys, there's telehealth available through their website with a healthcare provider that will make sure you're a good candidate for this medication. And if you are, they will ship it directly to your house. So no more excuses. 2022 is here. The pandemic is almost over. Let's have some fun. I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much for having Thank me. You, I Cindy. appreciate I'm truly, it. truly honored.